All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's Explore Classroom event. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. It's been an awesome month so far in Explore Classroom. We have been diving deep into the issue of endangered species uh, and, of course, conservation. So we've been really lucky to talk to scientists and explorers from all around the world who dedicated their life to studying and protecting species, protecting our biodiversity, and, of course, the habitats that those species need to survive. Because we haven't been doing a very good job as stewards of our planet. Um, there's been five mass extinction events in the history of our planet, and scientists believe that we could be in the midst of the sixth mass extinction event right now, and unfortunately, it's due to human activity. So all kinds of things are playing a role, things like pollution, um, habitat loss, uh, uh, the illegal pet trade, all kinds of things, overfishing in the ocean are contributing uh, to the loss of species that we are seeing. But the good news is we get to talk to awesome people like Tashi today who are doing amazing work all over the world. So Tashi Dendup, he is a uh, native to Bhutan. He's a forestry officer at the Ugen Wungchuk Institute for Conservation and Environmental Research under Bhutan's uh, Department of Forest and Park Services. For the last four years, he's used camera traps in central and eastern Bhutan uh, to document and study mainly endangered species, including the tiger and other small felids. So he serves as a member of the International Union of Conservation of Nature uh, and Species Survival Commission in the Cat Specialist Group, but he's also interested in understanding the ecology and conservation of wild cats uh, and using non-invasive tools to monitor them, such as the camera traps uh, that we mentioned earlier. So Tashi, it's so great to have you joining us uh, live today. Uh, we're excited to learn a little bit more about you. We've got classrooms joining us from across North America, both on YouTube and on camera, and we're excited to hear a little bit about your work. Um, <clears throat> uh, hello, everyone. Um, can you all hear me? I, I hope everyone can hear me. Okay, so um, as Joe mentioned, I am Dashi and uh, I'm from Bhutan. And I'm not quite sure how many of you must have heard about Bhutan. So if you have heard about Bhutan, can you raise your hands? Wow, this is really nice. Okay, so um, today I'm going to be talking um, briefly about tigers and then I will also be talking about Bhutan and then my work there. So maybe um, I'll start off with the presentation then. Yeah. Yep, sounds good. Okay. Share. Hmm. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Uh, try again. It didn't seem to share. Okay. Hmm. Zoom button appears to have disappeared somewhere. Okay. Well, we'll figure it out. Technology can be tricky sometimes. Uh, down at the bottom, is it still down at the bottom menu? The share right in the middle? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. Yeah. We are in business. Great. So, uh, like I shared before, today I'm going to be talking about tiger monitoring in Bhutan using non-invasive tools. And by non-invasive, I mean you don't um, handle the animal physically. And by tools, I'll be talking about uh, more about camera traps and then a little bit about non-invasive um, genetics. Okay. So um, I'll be talking briefly about Bhutan and biodiversity. Then I'll be talking about the tigers worldwide and then in Bhutan. And then what is the science behind counting tigers? So while I start, I'll be briefly, um, I would like to share that I I'm from Bhutan, and uh, Bhutan is a small Himalayan kingdom in the eastern Himalayas, which is home to the Great Peaks and is also known as the Third Pole, home to 3,900 glaciers and more than 4,900 glacial lakes. And we have nine out of the 10 highest mountains in this um, Himalayan range. So um, I was always, uh, I always felt close to nature since a very young boy and not really as a conservationist or environmentalist, but um, I liked reading poems. I liked to write poems. So I was um, kind of like 
a romantic lover of nature. But it was uh, after I uh, completed my uh, 12th standard uh, when I went to India to pursue a four years degree in uh, bachelor's in forestry. And then recently I also got this opportunity to pursue master's in wildlife biology at the University of Montana. So it's been about seven years since I've been uh, actively working in the field of conservation and wildlife research. So we'll go to Bhutan. So Bhutan is this um, very small country sandwiched between China to the north and India to the south. And we have landscapes from plains to the glaciers. And these landscapes are connected across altitudinal gradients. And these are incredibly biodiverse. And we have mountains as harbors of life from the greater Himalayas to the inner Himalayas, to high altitude valleys, to some of the last cool broadleaf forest in the Himalayas. So forests thrive across Bhutan. So because of this well-connected and uh, contiguous forest cover that we have in the country, while you are passing by um, the roads or crossing the high mountain passes, you will casually see magnificent and amazing uh, creatures like the red panda um, casually strolling or uh, crossing the road. And you will also see the golden langur, especially in the southern part of the country, which is the endangered uh, primate species. And then you'll also see this threatened uh, hornbill, in, um, that too in the southern part of the country. And yes, you will see the tigers all the way from the plains at about 100 meters um, altitude, all the way to the Alpine mountains above 4,600 meters. And we have all this wildlife um, living in harmony with people and communities. So Bhutan is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is a part of the Eastern Himalaya Biodiversity Hotspot. Um, we have about 200 species of mammals, 747 species of birds, and we also have 30% of the world's wildcat species. And Bhutan is home to about 100 tigers. Now tigers worldwide are in a desperate shape. So um, when I start talking about tigers, it will be a sad story, but hopefully um, later on in the presentation, I will some, show some beautiful pictures that will cheer you up and then uh, give some hope for the species. So tigers have been endangered um, and listed as endangered um, for about four decades now. And despite concerted efforts by um, governments, international NGOs and various conservationists across the world, they continue to be threatened by a lot of factors like habitat loss and fragmentation, poaching, prey depletion, and so on. So if you look at this map, the yellow portion indicates their historical range and the orange portion indicates their current range. So they have lost about 93% of the historical range. They used to be found in 30 different countries, three zero, but now they are found in only 13. And the situation is further <coughs> uh, worsened by the fact that a large portion of the remaining habitat of tigers are located in the developing countries with high human populations and rapid um, developmental change. In the beginning of the 20th century, there were about 100,000 tigers, but by the year 2017, we have less than 4,000. And a lot of these remaining um, tigers uh, are in small isolated populations, often less than 100, and then surrounded by hostile human landscapes. So India, which is home to about 60% of the global tiger population, lost about two tigers per week in the last three years. And recently, the tigers have also been declared functionally extinct in Cambodia. And the last tiger was um, camera trapped in, uh, in the year 2007 or so. So this is the global status of uh, the tigers as of 2016. So there, there were about 3,890. Now recently I read that besides Cambodia, Laos and Vietnam, they have also um, lost the tigers. So the tiger range countries have come from 13 to 10 which is really sad. So along this Himalayan belt where Bhutan is located um, in the northeastern uh, part of the Indian subcontinent, we have very low human density, very low um, rates of uh, development. And then we have a lot of forest cover as you can see from this, uh, the green color. So these, this area can be a future for tiger. So in Bhutan, we have about 100 tigers, and we have a density of 
0.24 tigers per 100 kilometer squares. And this density is for the whole country. But if you look at this map, we have certain areas, darker areas, where you can find two to three tigers per 100 kilometer square. And the Bhutan is able to sustain, despite being a small country, we are able to sustain such huge, um, incredible biodiversity and a good population of tigers because we have 71% of our country under forest cover. And then our constitution mandates that at least 60% of the country should remain under forest cover for all times to come. And 51.4% of the country is under protected areas in the form of national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, and biological corridors. And like I mentioned before, we have very low human, human density. Now tigers are also integral part of our religion, culture, and traditions. The Buddhist believes that respect all life forms have allowed tigers and their prey to exist alongside people and their livestock. <coughs> so counting tigers. So there are two popular uh, monitoring tools for uh, tigers that we use. So one is camera traps and one is non-invasive genetics. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, people use camera traps for a lot of reasons. Um, they provide data that can be used in um, models or statistical analysis that are very robust. And the images that we get from camera traps also serve as a very powerful medium to connect with and influence policymakers and the public. And the bycatch images that we get from these camera trap surveys also provide critical information on <coughs> the ecology of uh, other sympatric species. So the um, thing that you see uh, on the slide is a camera trap. So we keep these camera traps in the forest and when an animal passes by, it takes pictures. However, it can be very challenging, especially in a mountainous terrain like Bhutan, because uh, in Bhutan we have um, high and steeper uh, hills and mountains, so it's really difficult to set up camera traps. We are able to do it like set up one camera trap in a day, and if you are able to set up two, then um, that's a very productive day. And the cameras are also very expensive, and then it provides limited information on connectivity, meaning how animals are moving. So the other alternative that people use to count tiger is the non-invasive genetics. So uh, for a study that I recently did in Bhutan, I used tiger poop. So I went to the field, I collected the tiger poop, and then I extracted DNA from the tiger poop. And from that DNA, I'm able to individually identify all of the tigers. I'm also able to say whether it's a male or a female. And genetics also gives me this information about um, their movement. Yes, so they are also <coughs> very statistically robust and they are often cost effective and they provide information on connectivity and the genetic health. And um, genetics can also play a very important role in curbing illegal wildlife trade. However, um, their cost can be affected by um, various laboratory challenges and the poop is obviously less scarce than a beautiful tiger picture. So that's the um, cons of using non-invasive genetics. So for the study that I mentioned, um, I did my study in Royal Manas National Park. Uh, the Royal Manas National Park is located in the south central part of the country. It is the oldest national park in the country and is characterized by subtropical uh, um, climate and uh, subforest and these grasslands. So I had cameras set up along the southern part of uh, the national park. And then I also went there to collect tiger poop. So I'll be sharing some pictures from uh, uh, those uh, field work. So these are my friends when we were in the field. Um, so we, here we have just completed um, our, uh, having our breakfast, getting ready to go um, in the field. And then these are some of my friends uh, leading the way into the forest. And here, uh, one of my friends, uh, he came across uh, a poop and then he's trying to see whether it's really tiger. So if he, if, if it is a tiger, then uh, we, we will pick it up. So in case of camera traps, while you're in the field uh, to set up the camera traps, first of all, you have to look for animal signs such as um, poop. 
So when you're in the forest and if you are looking for tigers and then if you see um, poop that you think might belong to them, uh, you choose their site. Like you can also find these scratch marks on trees. And then we also choose um, trails that the animal would use. And sometimes you can also see these tiger bug marks. And uh, these are also uh, bug marks. So if you, if, uh, if you see um, animal poop or scratches, or if you come across a very good trail that an animal might use or bug marks, then we, we choose those sites to set up camera traps. Like this one. So usually if you have uh, big trees around, then we would set off the cameras at about 50 centimeter above the ground. So we would tie the um, camera traps on the trees and then put it on. But if you don't have big trees around, then you can also use wooden post. And if even wooden posts are not available, then you can even use um, rock. And then after you have set up the camera traps, we usually do this um, test. So we walk in front of uh, the camera traps acting like we, we are tigers or any other wild animal. And then uh, we check the images and see that the whole body so in case of tigers, when we want to identify the individuals, it is very important that you take a very good picture, uh, especially the side body. So in areas where you have um, elephants, so elephants, um, they do not like to see uh, foreign objects in, in their habitat. So if they come across cameras, then they usually break them. So one of the techniques that our friends in the field use is we take elephant poop and then <coughs> we um, um, keep the elephant poop around the cameras. So they, they um, don't like to come uh, near their poop, so they usually avoid those cameras. And <coughs> at the end of the camera survey, we go to the field and then we download the images. Uh, some of the images that you would get. So this study was uh, uh, recently done uh, in one of uh, um, a forest near my uh, office. So yeah. So for identifying tigers, just like humans have um, different fingerprints, we all say that you know each individual has d different um, fingerprints. So in case of even in case of tigers each individual tiger, they have d different stripe patterns on their body. For example, here, um, at first glance, you might say that these are two um, different unique individuals. But if you look closely on this hind leg, then here you will see a two pattern. And you will also see the same on, in the other photo. And by looking at this, we know that, okay, these two individuals, these two different, um, the pictures of these two different tigers are not different individuals, but the same one. So using camera traps, this is how we identify unique individuals. But sometimes um, we have other animals like uh, deer where you're not able to, um, uh, because they do not have uh, unique patterns like these on their body, you are not able to individually identify them. Yep. So in case of scat, <coughs> so um, in scientific term, uh, we call the poop as scat. So in my uh, field work, I um, collected scats like this. So these scats belong to tigers. And from the camera traps, I kept the camera traps in the field for about six months. And then I got about more than 350,000 pictures and 2,813 videos. So which I had to sort all by myself. And from there, I was able to get 22 individuals and a cup. And I was able, also able to identify that there were four males and then 11 females. Now, one of the drawbacks or limitations with camera traps is that you are not all, always able to tell whether the individual that you get are male or female. So in this case, I didn't know um, the gender of uh, seven individuals. And uh, <coughs> I did some uh, statistical analysis and then I got a tiger density of 2.38 tigers per 100 kilometers square. So using um, the scat sampling or the poop collection, I collected 61 tiger poop, which I thought belonged to tigers. But uh, when I took those uh, tiger poop in the lab and when I tested it, only 31, about 50% were uh, really belonged to tiger. And then only 18 of the 31 worked. And then I was able to um, identify eight individuals and uh, we, I got five males and three females. 
And from the um, poop survey, I um, obtained a density of 3.98 tigers per 100 kilometer square. So in the same area using camera traps, I was also able to um, uh, infer that there are seven species of wildcats. So here you'll see this is um, on the left corner, this is the tiger, then we have the common leopard, then we have the clouded leopard, we have the leopard cat, we have the Asiatic golden cat, we have the marble cat, and then down below we have the jungle cat. So Royal Manas National Park is one of uh, very few places on uh, in the world having such huge diversity of wildcats. So from here on, I'll be sharing um, a lot of uh, pictures from uh, the camera traps. So this is a female tiger, which was radio called um, last year um, in the same area by a team of uh, Bhutanese biologists. And then uh, it was uh, photographed near a water hole. And this picture was taken in the northern part of the country. So um, <clears throat> with the camera traps, we not only take pictures, but you're also able to take videos. And this video gives us um, another hope that uh, Bhutan could be a, a, is a safe haven for tigers. So here you see the tiger cubs. And uh, this picture I took in Royal Manas National Park uh, during my field work. So these are Asiatic water buffaloes. These are also endangered, but uh, they are also an important prey for tiger. And this is in the central part of uh, the country as well. So the earlier uh, tiger, tigers and the cubs, it was in the northern part of the country. Now this is in the central part. And then if you go to the southern part of the country, you will see the tigers are breeding as well. So from these three pictures, um, we can infer the tigers are uh, breeding across the country and then uh, Bhutan does have a good uh, viable population of tigers. So you also get a few amazing um, cute pictures like this. So this is a red fox. You also get the yellow throated martin. So this is much um, a bit higher uh, up in the mountains. And then from here on, I'll show a set of pictures that were taken at the same location, just to show the diversity that we have, you know, even in small localities. So this is a sambar deer. Uh, it is also a very important prey species for tiger. And then this is a leopard, the common leopard. And this is a barking deer. This is a serao. This is a goral, so it's like a goat. And we have the Himalayan black bear. And then a lot of uh, wild pigs. So these are also very important prey species for tigers in Bhutan. So these are, yeah, and then you have tigers in the same place. And then the Asiatic golden cat, Sambar again. This one is a marble cat, tiger again. And then a lot of piglets. So this camera was set up um, much higher, um, above 4,000 meters above sea level. And then you see this cute wild dogs, which are another important uh, predators found in Bhutan. They can be found in groups up to 24 in Bhutan. And then you have this yellow-throated martin again. And then you also see the red pandas high up in the mountains. And yes, uh, these were my friends who helped me during my field work. Um, last year in Royal Manas National Park for the camera trapping as well as for um, collecting tiger poop. Yeah. All right, Tashi, thanks so much for sharing that awesome presentation with us. Um, 
Oops, my camera's off for some reason. There we go. Um, you're doing awesome conservation work and it's really cool to be able to get kind of a peek uh, into these very private animals life uh, using camera traps. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you, um, you and all the students uh, liked uh, seeing the pictures. Oh, absolutely. And like you said, it's, uh, you know, it's a tough story to hear, you know, the, what we're doing to our planet and especially amazing species like the tiger. But it's also exciting to see that there are some strongholds and maybe some places where they are still doing OK if we can protect those areas. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think it's time that we meet some of our classroom <coughs> and we start to grab some questions. So just a quick shout out to any YouTube classrooms. I know Mr. Chris's grade twos in Michigan are hanging out with us. Uh, any classrooms who are joining there, send in a, a message. Let us know where you're watching from. Send in some questions. But for now, we're going to go to some live classrooms. Mm -hmm. The first we're going to go to Mr. Green's class, fourth graders hanging out with us in Alabama. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Alabama? Hey. Good to see you. Who's up with a question? Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, from the wildcats that I showed, um, the tiger is endangered. And then on the ISIN red list, so there is a red list where which gives the conservation status of these different um, species. So on that conservation status, we have the tiger as endangered. And then we have the clouded as clouded leopard as vulnerable. They are also threatened, but they are at a status a little below than um, the tigers in in terms of uh, the threats that they are facing across the world. And then um, yes, we also have the marble cat that is vulnerable. But out of that, the endangered um, wild cat is the tiger. All right, great question to kick things off. We are now going to visit some grade sevens hanging out with us uh, in Sheffield. They're hanging out with Mr. Rapport. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, grade sevens? All right, I think they heard us. Grade sevens, a bit louder for us. How are you guys doing? All right, whoever's up with a question, you gotta come nice and close because the microphone's a little bit quiet. So we were wondering about how many species are still on free land and how that affects any of the species. Okay. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you properly. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Report. Your microphone's gone really quiet on us. Can you try and get nice and close to the computer? So, can you hear me now? Yeah, but you gotta stay nice and close. I don't know, Mr. Uh, Rapport, what happened with the microphone, but if you want to uh, type the question for us in the chat bar. That might be a better option. So there's a chat, a little speech bubble at the bottom, but for whatever reason, uh, the microphone's gone really quiet on us. But while we wait for that question, I'm gonna jump to Mrs. Salazar's class. They're in Laredo, Texas. Some high schoolers hanging out with us and they get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Texas? Hi. All right, who's up? Uh, <coughs> what other endangered species are you studying? Uh, what are some of the endangered species that I'm studying? Yes, what other species are you studying? Um, mostly um, these days I'm concentrating on tigers, but very soon I also have pl plans to do the same things. Um, I mean, study the same things about snow leopard that I did of um, snow leopards, I mean the tigers. So even with the, the snow leopards, I'm planning to use camera traps to monitor their numbers and then also use the genetics to study their genetic health and uh, movement and gene flow. So yeah, very soon, uh, hopefully, I'll be starting something on snow leopards. All right, so I hope you're able to get that project off the ground because you know snow leopards can be even more elusive 
than tigers. So it'll be great to get some images yeah. and see how the mm -hmm. snow leopards are doing. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Julian's group, grade five, six is hanging out with us in Toronto, Ontario, here, here in Canada. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing Toronto? How many different types of tigers are there? And what's your favorite? Yeah, so uh, presently there are, <coughs> so as a species, we have only one tiger, but then um, as a subspecies, presently we have six. So the one that we have in Bhutan is the Royal Bengal tiger. So because I'm studying the Royal Bengal tiger, um, it's my favorite. All right, that seems pretty fair. If it's the one you spend the most time with, that's a definitely yeah. a reason for it to be the favorite. All right, uh, let's see. Mrs. Gallo's group, they are joining us in Ontario. Uh, looks like another high school group. Let me get their microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, boys and girls? Hi. Hi. So, <coughs> how much work goes into the protection of endangered tigers? Um, a lot of work. Like I mentioned before, um, international um, governments, international NGOs, various conservationists, they have been working on saving the tigers for about five decades. Um, the tigers were listed as endangered on the ice and red list in 1969. And over these years, um, despite you know so much of effort, they are, they still continue to be in desperate shape. The governments are trying their best. Um, conservationists are trying their best. NGOs are trying their best. They are putting in a lot of money. They are putting in a lot of time. You know, um, and even on the field, you have all those rangers uh, patrolling these forests uh, all the time, trying to save these tigers from poaching. And then you also have people trying to um, keep the habitats of uh, tiger safer and connected. Yeah, so a, a lot of things are being done. Yeah, it's a tricky issue. I mean, like you said, five decades, 50 years of conservation and numbers yeah. are still in trouble. And there's still, I, I mean, you listed some of the reasons, loss of habitat, um, mm. confrontation with humans. Um, I, I know there's livestock issues, uh, mm -hmm. so all kinds of issues that are, um, uh, leading through demise. Um, are you kind of seeing some of those similar issues where you are? Um, or do you think that the public is, be is kind of coming more on board with uh, protecting tigers and realizing that they're an important species? Yeah, so <coughs> recently we had an instance where a group of uh, hunters, they came forward and then they said, you know, we, we now give up hunting and then we will practice um, religion. And so a lot of these kind of initiatives are being organized across the country and uh, people are um, coming on board. And in terms of retaliatory killing, like through livestock depredation, um, we do have uh, cases of um, tigers killing livestock, but uh, so far people have been very tolerant they think that you know, if a tiger comes and kills the kills the livestock, maybe is a bad luck or some, or maybe that you know bad incident would take all their bad luck. So they they are very much tolerant. I think um, a couple of years ago there was one case of um, retaliation, but then I um, I haven't heard anything uh, after that. All right. Well, that's a good sign when the public uh, is on board, uh, then conservation work can be a lot. Yeah, maybe a little bit easier, a little bit uh, to, when you have open mind to the community. So we're going to jump to a grade five, six class mm -hmm. hanging out in Toronto with Mrs. Rambaran. Let me get their microphone turned on. There we go. How are we doing, Toronto? All right. Very cool. Who's up? How are tigers a part of your culture? <coughs> Um, so it's, um, like one of the most f famous or most popular anecdote about, uh, tigers in our culture is that, um, the Buddhism, which is our state religion here was first brought to the country 
country is supposed to have been brought to the country by a very like a big um like a saint and uh, when he first came to bhutan um he, he said to have rode uh you know a tigress a burning tigress so in in the western part of bhutan we have a monastery known as the tigress nest and it's located far high up in the cliff and he said that um the saint you know rode that tigress and then he landed there and then from there you know most of the other things on buddhism they spread in the country and then even across um um the country you know on even on the buildings you would see tiger as a you know a ferocious tiger as a sign of protection and even when you are playing games people usually like to, so um we have um we um like the zodiac signs um so we have different animals um not really like the zodiac sign but uh, i can't really remember what we call that but we have 12 different animals that represent like okay this year is the year of this one or the dog the year of the pig or the year of the dragon so people who are born in the year of the tiger you know whether you are playing a game or whether you are going in a war so usually those people are you know they are no so supposed to be brave and then usually they lead the charge so we have a lot of these things in our culture yeah all right very cool very steeped uh in the in the culture it looks like tigers are an important part uh mm -hmm. so mr rap for's group <laughs> sheffield they typed a question to me the grade 7 so let's get them while they're here i'm going to lock onto their camera screen grade 7s give us a big wave uh so we can see you guys we're locked on your screen there we go there they are and so they're wondering about uh interactions with tigers how do you encourage um positive interactions between uh people and tigers um positive interaction as as in i think uh, if you want to protect the species we really need to value the species um and it it comes with um creating that positive mindset in people or the communities you know um so in in bhutan what we do is that um we promote ecotourism and then we also uh try to bring people uh, make them integral into our conservation activities we provide um upliftment uh livelihood upliftment um opportunities for uh the people which all comes as a result of tiger conservation so people they know that okay we are benefiting from all these um programs because you know these programs are targeted to us um tiger conservation so slowly um they they do appreciate uh uh the tigers in being in their um ecosystem okay very cool so i think we can probably track <laughs> in another question or two uh before you wrap up today so uh let's get the classrooms give me a big wave in your classroom if you guys have a question that you really want me to come back uh and grab so we're going to start with mrs julian's class i'm going to turn your microphone on What are the tigers prey? And how much do they weigh? <coughs> the tiger. Um mm -hmm. So uh some of the pictures that I showed like the sambar they are very important uh prey species for tiger and then even the wild pigs. So last year when I went to the field to do my uh the the uh tiger poop survey So I also had the chance to look at the content um in those poop and we found a lot of um the hair of uh pigs and uh and the hooves of different deer species. So principally in Bhutan um sambar deer um which can be like as big as um elk there in, in America. Yeah, so they can be as big as elk and then you we also have a wild cattle known as gaur. So these they look exactly like um similar to our um the the cow or the cattle that we have in our farms but they are much sturdier and much stronger we also have that and then smaller species prey species would include the pigs and then um serow and um the barking deer yeah so the their weight can vary from like um 30 or 20 kg all the way to um, more than 50 kg or even 100 yeah Okay. Um let's visit one more class. Uh who's got a question? Give me a wave. All right, it's hard when so many classes are waving, but let's try our class 
Um, Mrs. Rambaran's group. Let me turn their microphone on. Um, what, was, what was your favorite animal to study? What is my favorite animal to study? Yeah, I think I know the answer to this one. Um, yeah. <laughs> so previously, before I started working on tigers, I was more focused on um, the smaller cats. They are cuter and they are also threatened, but not much is known about them. So until I started studying tigers, it was the palace cat. So I didn't really show that picture. But then after I start, started, um, started studying tigers, knowing about his ecology and then its role in the ecosystem and how beautiful, how magnificent they are now, <coughs> yeah, it's the tiger. Yeah. All right. And I think we can squeeze in Mr. Green's class. Yeah. There David likes to squeeze in, so I think we should class. You guys have one more question, Mr. Green? Question, Mr. What was your favorite um, animal that you found on your cameras? Oh, my. Okay. <laughs> Did you catch that one? He's asking about maybe a favorite animal or image that you caught on the camera trap. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's the Asiatic golden cat. So the Asiatic golden cat, even though it is one species, but it has different uh, morphs. So um, in Bhutan, we have four different morphs of the Asiatic golden cat. So in one of the camera trips near um, the campus where I work, we actually got a footage where two different morphs were playing together. So um, one is a, we have a spotted morph known as the ocelot morph. And then we also have a golden brown morph. Then we have a melanistic morph and then we have a gray morph. But in that picture, um, it, well, it photographed a ocelot morph and a golden morph playing together. So th that was really, really beautiful. All right, very cool. Well, first, I want to give a shout out to our classrooms on YouTube, as well as the classrooms who joined us live on camera today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the awesome questions. And then, Tashi, I have to say a huge thank you to you. Thank you for joining us. I know you had to uh, stay up for us because it's uh, later in the evening for you. Um, thank you for the awesome conservation work you're doing. And most of all, thank you for being willing to share it with us today on Explore Classroom. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, this is my first time, so maybe, uh, I don't know if, if it really went that well, but uh, I really hope that by the next time I'll, I'll give a much um, better uh, presentation. But I really enjoyed this experience. I'm really thankful to everyone for listening to me. And then I really hope that you all enjoyed um, some of the things that I shared and then the pictures. So yeah, really looking forward to the next one. No, you did an awesome Awesome job. It was a lot of fun. I know you're on Twitter. It's at underscore uh, Tashi Dendip. So uh, classrooms, if you took some pictures and you want to share those online, don't forget to tag at Nat Geo Education, but tag Tashi as well because I'm sure he'd like to see some pictures of your classrooms in action. And the last yeah. thing we're going to do today is I'm going to turn the microphones on. So boys and girls, if you want to get nice and loud, uh, a big goodbye and thank you. So here we go. Microphones coming on. Thank you. All right. Awesome job, boys and girls. I knew uh, you were the right ones to pick for this job. Good job. Tashi, again, thank you so much. And we'll <laughs> see everybody on the next Explore Classroom. Thank you. Thank you so much.